Hey guys, it's day 23. That means we are in Matthew chapter 23. So we're coming right off of the last verse of 22 that said that the Pharisees didn't, um, from that day did not dare to ask him any more questions. And it's almost like as you just to go to the next verse, right? Chapter 23, verse 1. It's this idea where you almost see that Jesus doesn't want to talk to them anymore either, right? They've they've had their battles. Jesus has tried to win them. He's tried to convert them. He's tried to share them about grace and mercy. They've refused, and now they don't want to talk to him anymore. They're going to go on their route. They're going to go on God's plan to, to bring Jesus to the cross, and now Jesus is really not going to bother with them anymore. And a lot can be said here um, to, to go with the sermon that I preached on Sunday um, about kind of that idea that um, once you deny the spirit so much, uh, you, you don't know if you're given a next chance. And we can almost see here where they have denied and denied and denied and denied the person of Christ. And now um, they're denying and Jesus says, OK, I'm moving on. And we'll see a little bit more of that as we get into that. And so, but 23 starts with not talking to those Pharisees, not talking with those Pharisees, but um, talking to the crowds, right? The very first verse, he said to the crowds and the disciples. So the Pharisees were probably still there, okay? They're probably still around. They're still listening, but he's more talking about the crowds because this is what he wants them to hear. And he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Uh, this is really um, means two things. One is that they are standing in religious leadership like Moses did for Israel. So uh, what Jesus is saying is um, they're your authorities. You should honor that, even though they're not the best authority, but you should honor that. And also Moses' seat is another um, uh, it's an illustration that in the synagogue, there would be a chair, a, a cement chair that was affixed to the floor um, in which the rabbi of the day, a chief a rabbi, a visiting rabbi would come in and he would he would uh, teach from that chair. OK, so there is. So Jesus is saying the Pharisees are the teaching people of Jerusalem. Right. These are the people that are teaching you God's word, even though it's not the best. They're teaching you about God's word, okay? And in that, and know what he says. He says, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. It's the same thing that we say to our kids, right? It, the idea of um, it's okay to, to listen to them. It, it's okay to hear the things that they're saying. And some of the things that they're saying is okay. It's okay to hear them, but don't be like them, right? Right? And that's where the Pharisees were. The things that they were saying were not always wrong. It was to the context of which they were acting it out and living it out. Sure, they were adding to the law. They were adding things. But even if they were, if somebody was to live out exactly what they were saying, they would be living to God's law, doing some extra things that they didn't really need to do. But they would still be okay. They would still be learning and leaning on um, the law of God. But the Pharisees' life, they did not practice that out. And so really this chapter, chapter 23, um, really deals with what is called as the seven woes. Jesus goes through seven points of why these Pharisees are wrong. And we see it over and over again. We've, we've read it in Matthew, right? The first shall be last, the last shall be first. And he's pointing a lot of these out. And so we get the first woe in verse 13, right? He calls them hypocrites and basically says, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He's saying that you bring human tradition and you bring religion, a religious tradition so much in front of what God's word is that people don't even get to God's word, right? You, you just drown them with nonsense before they even got get to God's word. And he tells them, woe is you, right? Wrong is you. Woe to you as in you better change your way or we know where you're going, right? You're going to hell. The second woe, verse 15, uh, he says, for you travel across sea and land and make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, uh, you make him twice as much as a child of hell. It's their evangelism methods, right? It's the idea is that they're not trying to reach people to convert people to be 
children of God, they're reaching out to convert people to be children of the Pharisees. And so they're not reaching out um, to change people for God. They're, they're change, they're, they are reaching out to make people worship them, right? And to grow up and to be disciples of them. The third woe in verse 16, woe to you blind gods. If anyone swears by the temple is nothing, but if someone swears by the gold. And it's a whole idea that the Pharisees made up this whole tradition of, of these oaths and pledges and all these things of what, of what they could do, what they could say, what they could. They just kind of made up this whole like little system and what they could say is right and what they could say is wrong. And Jesus has basically said, which is greater, the gift or the altar, right? What is better, what you say or the thing that cleans it, the altar, right? And so, of course, it was the thing is greater. Jesus is greater than the things that you say about Jesus, okay? That, that's that's kind of where um, it was going. Uh, verse 23, we get the fourth woe. Woe to you, uh, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and you've neglected the waiter things. They would get into the minute things, right? When it comes to tithing, it wasn't just writing a check to a church or going on the website and entering a credit card number. It wasn't that. They would very, um, they would, they would very much count everything out out loud, in person, you know, so everybody knew. And they, they carried about the smallest detail of the law, but they didn't care about the true heart of the law, which was justice, which was mercy, which was faithfulness. They had no idea what that was, right? They carried about the little dots, but not about the big, the big point. In verse 25, we get the fifth woe. Woe to you. You clean the outside of the cup of the plate, but on the inside, you're full of greed and self-indulgence, right? This idea that says on the outside, you look like you're great. You look like you're holy. You you wear these robes and you say how holy you are, but on the inside, you're you're filthy, right? Uh, and, and it's just that, that, that adage that we say, right? Out of the mouth, right, is what we can see is the inside, right? Out of the mouth, we can see the heart. And so that's what Jesus is saying. And because a lot of times, remember, we're reading this and we say, ooh, Pharisees bad. But Pharisees were role models for most Jews, right? And so here Jesus is pointing out and has been pointing out for 23 chapters, but is pointing out here what is wrong, that they are they are dirty on the inside, but only clean on the outside. And that is no good. Verse 27, we get the six woe for you are whitewashed tombs. During uh, Passover, uh, Jews would whitewash the tombs. What I mean on the outside of the tombs, they would basically paint with uh, some white paint and some water. They would whitewash them. So if anybody accidentally touched a tomb, they would not be um, considered dirty or unclean for Passover. Uh, this was a practice that always happened. It just happened. And he basically he's saying, you guys are whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, you're a bag of bones. You're dead, right? You look like you're living on the outside, but you're really dead. And we get the last woe in verse 29. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, verse 31, but you murder the prophets. These, these um, Pharisees, they would worship uh, the dead prophets of the past, but they're coming and killing the future living prophets, right? They're saying, oh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, oh, you were so great. You were so wonderful. All the while, they're beheading John the Baptist. They're going to crucify Jesus, right? They have they have no idea, right? They have no idea of what's standing in front of them. And then we see at the very end, um, probably one of the most impactful things that you see when you go to Israel is, is kind of standing and looking over Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus is there, verse 37. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood? In the book of Luke, chapter 19, we get the same story, and it says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He's saying, oh, my goodness, I, I wanted to save you. They're... they're the problem of the Pharisees, the problem of Israel was not that Jesus wasn't willing. It was that they weren't willing, right? He came, he professed who he was, but they denied who he was. And it brought Jesus to tears. He wept and said, oh, I've come to you many times to bring you salvation, but you have denied salvation. Um, and so he says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a very important verse. 
Verse 39, very, very important. This is what it's telling is in this, the second coming of Jesus. Jesus will not come back again until the nation of Israel, until Jewish people will welcome Jesus as the Messiah and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And you can go a whole lot into that and I can really lean into that, but it just shows us that in order for Jesus to come back, Israel must be ready to profess him as the Messiah. So as we hear of Israel growing uh, and more Jews coming to Jesus, we just know we're getting closer. Guys, went long again today. I know these are big chapters, a lot's in there. Hope it's making more sense. We will see you tomorrow uh, on, on chapter 24. God bless.